this is Mr. Fairbix, and we have the one and only Ivan. Today we are reading pages 60 to 78. Stella is the first to notice the change, but soon we all feel it. A new animal is coming to the Big Top Mall. How do we know this? Because we listen, we watch, and most of all, we sniff the air. Humans always smell odd when changes in the air, like rotten meat with a hint of papaya. Bob fears our new neighbor will be a giant cat with slitted eyes and a coiled tail. But Stella says a truck will arrive this afternoon carrying a baby elephant. How do you know, I ask. I sample the air, but all I smell is caramel corn. I love caramel corn. I can hear her, Stella says. She's crying for her mother. I listen. I hear the cars charging past. I hear the snore of the sun bears in their wire domain, but I don't hear any elephants. You were just hoping, I say. Stella closes her eyes. No, she says softly. Not hoping, not at all. My TV is off, so while we wait for the new neighbor, I ask Stella to tell us a story. Stella rubs her right front foot against the wall. Her foot is swollen again, an ugly deep red. If you're not feeling well, Stella, I say, you could take a nap and tell us a story later. I'm fine, she says, and she carefully shifts her weight. Tell us the Jumbo story, I say. It's a favorite of mine, but I don't think Bob has ever heard it. Because she remembers everything, Stella knows many stories. I like colorful tales with black beginnings and stormy middles and cloudless blue sky endings, but any story will do. I'm not in a position to be picky. Once upon a time, Stella begins, there was a human boy. He was visiting a gorilla family at a place called a zoo. What's a zoo? Bob asks. He's a street smart dog. There's, there's much he hasn't seen. A good zoo, Stella says, is a large domain, a wild cage, a safe place to be, it has rooms to roam, and humans who don't hunt. She pauses, considering her words. A good zoo is how humans make amends. Stella moves a bit, groaning softly. The boy stood on a wall, she continues, watching, pointing, but he lost his balance and fell into the wild cage. Humans are clumsy, I interrupt. If only they would knuckle walk. They wouldn't topple so often. Stella nods. A good point, Ivan. In any case, the boy lay in a motionless heap while the humans gasped and cried. The silverback, whose name was Jumbo, examined the boy, as was his duty, while his troop watched from a safe distance. Jumbo stroked the child gently. He smelled the boy's pain, and then he stood watch. When the boy awoke, his humans cried out, stay still, don't move, because they were certain, humans are always certain about things, that Jumbo would crush the boy's life from him. The boy moaned, the crowd waited, hushed, expecting the worst. Jumbo led his troop away. Men came down on ropes and whisked the child in waiting arms. Was the boy all right? Bob asks. He wasn't hurt, Stella says. Although I wouldn't be surprised if his parents hugged him many times that night in between their scoldings. Bob, who has been chewing his tail, pauses, tilting his head. Is that a true story? I always tell the truth, Stella replies, although sometimes I confuse the facts. I've heard the Jumbo story many times. Stella says the humans found it odd that the huge silverback didn't kill the boy. Why, I wonder. Why was that so surprising? The boy was young, scared, alone. He was, after all, just another grade eight. Bob nudges me with his cold nose. Ivan, he says, why aren't you and Stella in a zoo? I look at Stella. She looks at me. She smiles sadly with her eyes, just a little, the way only elephants can do. Just lucky, I guess, she says. The new neighbor arrives after four o'clock show. When the truck comes lumbering towards the parking lot, Bob scampers over to inform us. Bob always knows what's happening. He's a useful friend to have, especially when you can't leave your domain. With a groan, Mac lifts the sliding metal door near the food court, the place where deliveries are made. A big white truck is backing up to the door, belching smoke. When the driver opens the truck, I know that Stella is right. A baby elephant is inside. I see her trunk poking out from the blackness. I'm glad for Stella. When I glance at her, I see she is not glad at all. Stand back, everyone, Mac yells. We've got a new arrival. This is Ruby, folks. 
600 pounds of fun to save our sorry butts. This gal is going to sell us some tickets. Mac and the two men climb into the black cave of the truck. We hear noise, scuffling, a word Mac uses when he's angry. Ruby makes a sound too, like one of the little trumpets they sell at the gift store. Move, Mac says, but still there is no Ruby. Move, he says again. We haven't got all day. Inside her domain, Stella paces as much as she's able. Two steps one way, two steps the other. She slaps her trunk against the rusty metal bars. She grumbles. Stella, I ask, did you hear the baby? Stella mutters something under her breath, a word she uses when she's angry. Relax, Stella, I say. It'll be okay. Ivan, Stella says. It will never, ever be okay. And I know enough to stop talking. The men still yelling. Some of the yelling is at each other, but most of it at Ruby. We are scrambling, pounding, shifting, and the side of the truck shudders. I'm starting to like this elephant, Bob whispers. I'm getting the big one, Max says. Maybe she can coax the stupid brat out of the truck. Mac opens Stella's door. Come on, girl, he urges. He unties the rope attached to the floor bolt. Stella pushes past Mac, nearly knocking him over. She rushes as best as she can, limping heavily, towards the open back door of the truck. She catches her swollen foot on the edge of the ramp and winces. Blood trickles down. Halfway up the ramp, she pauses. The noise in the truck stops. Ruby falls silent. Slowly, Stella makes her way up the rest of the ramp. It groans under her weight. I can tell how much she is hurting by the awkward way she moves. At the top of the incline, she stops. She pokes her trunk into the emptiness. We wait. The tiny gray trunk appears again. Shyly, it reaches out, tasting the air. Stella curs curls her own trunk around the babies. They make soft rumbling sounds. We wait some more. A hush falls over the entire big top mall. Thud. Thud. Step, step, pause. Step, step, pause. And there she is. So small she can fit underneath Stella with room to spare. Her skin sags and she sways unsteadily as she makes her way down the ramp. Not the greatest specimen, Max says. But I got her cheap from this bankrupt circus out west. They had her shipped over from Africa. Only had her a month before they went bust. He gestures towards Ruby. Thing is, people love babies. Baby elephants, baby gorillas. Heck, Give me a baby alligator and I can make a killing. Stella ushers Ruby towards her domain. Mac and the two men follow. At Stella's door, Ruby hesitates. Mac gives Ruby a shove, but she doesn't budge. Doggone it, get a clue, Ruby, he mutters. But Ruby isn't moving and neither is Stella. Mac grabs a broom, he raises it. Instantly, Stella steps in front of Ruby to shield her. Get in the cage, bolt to you, Mac shouts. Stella stares at Mac, considering. Gently but firmly, Using her trunk, she nudges Ruby into her domain. Only then does Stella enter. Max slams the door shut with a clang. I see two trunks intertwined. I hear Stella whispering. Poor kid, says Bob. Welcome to the Exodate Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, home of the one and only Ivan. When Julia comes, she sits by Stella's domain and watches the new baby. She barely talks to me. Stella doesn't talk to me either. She's too busy nuzzling Ruby. She is cute, little Ruby, with her ears flapping like palm leaves, but I am a handsome and strong. Bob trots a circle around my belly before settling down at just the right spot. Give it up, Ivan, he says. You're old news. Julia gets out a piece of paper and pencil. I can see that she is drawing Ruby. I move to the corner of my domain to pout. Bob grumbles. He doesn't like it when I disrupt his naps. Homework, Julia father scolds. Julia sighs and puts her drawings aside. I grunt. Julia glances in my direction. Poor old Ivan, she says. I've been ignoring you, haven't I? I grunt again, a dignified and different grunt. Julia thinks for a moment, then smiles. She walks over to my domain to the spot in the corner where the glass is broken. She slides paper through. She rolls a pencil across my cement floor. You can draw the baby elephant too, Julia says. I bite the pencil in half with my, magnif my magnificent teeth, then I eat some paper. Even after Julia and her father leave, I try to keep sulking, but it's no use. Gorillas are not, by nature, powders. Stella, I call. It's a full moon, you see? Sometimes when we are lucky, we ca catch a glimpse of the moon through the skylight in the food court. I did, Stella says. She is whispering, and I realize that Ruby must be asleep. Is Ruby all right, I ask? 
She's too thin, Ivan, Stella says. Poor baby. She was in that truck for days. Matt brought her from a circus the same way he brought me, but he hadn't been there long. She hadn't been there long. She was born in the wild like us. Will she be okay? I ask. Stella doesn't answer my question. The circus trainers chained her to the floor. Ivan, all four feet, 23 hours a day. I puzzle over why this would be a good idea. I always try to give humans the benefit of the doubt. Why would they do that? I finally ask. To break her spirit, Stella says. So she can learn to balance at a pedestal. So she can stand on her hind legs. So a dog could jump on her back while she walked in mindless circles. I hear her tired voice. And I think of all the tricks Stella has learned. Stay tuned for more. I, the one and only Ivan.